Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm a virtual synopsis with Will Chen. I'm going to talk today about using AI to close the holes in coverage. Well, obviously, we're getting much more complex designs. Achieving coverage on these from verification is becoming much more difficult. What sort of problems are you seeing? Well, there are two main problems we have seen uh, with our customers. One is so-called time to coverage. How can we identify the redundancy to get to the same coverage as fast as possible. Now, as we know, it doesn't matter how hard you try, you will always have some so-called unhit coverage. Can the two find those out? Either they can be covered, then we try to get there and cover it for you. If you cannot cover it, then we give user the information why they cannot be covered. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Well, what are we looking at? Well, what we have on the whiteboard, I would like to look at coverage in terms of space and time. Let me talk about if we look at what we need to verify as a whole in this uh, quadrant. If we divide all the coverage objects we want to cover, let's say easy and difficult, and covered already or not yet covered, then we have this uh, quadrant. Now, if you look at each of the quadrants, we'll ask some simple questions. For example, if easy and already covered, can we cover them faster and reduce the redundancy of covering the same coverage object again and again? Now, if it's difficult to cover, can we increase the frequency of covering those so-called hard-to-hit, rare-to-hit objects? Look at this quadrant. It's easy, but not yet covered can be using some formal or other technology to identify those so-called uncoverable objects so that we don't need to even spend time covering them. Now, finally, it's difficult, not yet covered. Can AI machine learning provide some mechanism to find out the way to cover them or provide the information to user that they are, in fact, not coverable? Are there more of those uh, not yet covered difficult areas than there were in the past because we are getting into more complex designs? Definitely. We have seen that trend because nowadays there's a design itself is getting larger and larger and there's a lot of components, analog software, that's increasing so-called systematic complexity, causing a lot of corner cases or unknown areas to be discovered, relying on human being to find that out is too time consuming. And AI machine learning is a, a good way of analyzing a big data and trying to find the correlation between what was generated and what has actually happened. And also we're seeing designs going up into three dimensions now, which we didn't see in the past. How much does that affect what's going on here as well? Well, in terms of verification, we don't see that like three dimensional effect, but overall it's the state space the interconnect among different components will require a lot more verification to making sure we are not missing bugs that cause very expensive respin of the designs. And in addition to that, these devices are being used in more mission critical and safety critical applications, and they're also expected to last longer in the marketplace too, right? That's true. So functional safety, security, all add to the complexity of the design and likewise, for verification. So how do you get them from that difficult space that's not yet covered to covered? What has to change? So this is a very difficult problem and we are trying to look at different sites to so-called make some baby steps to, to solve it from some perspective and hopefully one day we can all put them together and fully automate it. For example, we can start from the stimulus. Can we generate more diversified stimulus so that we can cover more corners to hit those rare bugs. On the other hand, we can look at the coverage that verification engineer is interested. And from that point onward, find out how we can find the influence input signals so that we can say, hey, now I know the relationship. I know what you are trying, you are interested. Generate that type of stimulus in that sequence so that whatever you are observing can be covered faster. Basically, what you're looking for here is more data that actually is, this is related to this, and you don't necessarily have all that data yet, right? That's right. 
if we don't have the data, of, of course, machine learning cannot learn. And we have to have some prior knowledge for machine learning to learn in order to give a human the intelligence to optimize. Once you do that, once you start establishing patterns, do you potentially have more patterns that you can see that you didn't see before? Of course. That's, that's important to, first is building up the model that's ready to, to predict, but it's also more important of so-called incremental learning. As new data come in, design changes every day, new tests being added, and we can just incrementally learn and make the model always keep up with the environment change. And it's also more important, we're doing a lot of reuse from IP to IP, from IP to system. Can we reuse what we learn into a slightly different environment or new revision of the design? That's going to become critical as you start getting into the chiplet world, right? It's true. This is all about the, the space side of this. What happens on the time side? Right. So if we look to the left on the whiteboard, probably you have seen this graph many times. On the x-axis is the project cycle uh, from the beginning all the way to tape out. And the y-axis shows some kind of measurement, let's say just coverage, percentage. Of course, you want to get from zero all the way to 100 as 100% as fast as possible so that you have all the confidence to tape up and have a first success of your design. But nobody actually ever gets to 100%, right? That's correct. That's why it's important to identify all the bugs and making sure whatever you want to verify is have been verified. And also important to know what were remaining, you know where they are so that you can put the right focus on closing them. The bugs become more difficult to find, though, partly because they're compounded on top of other bugs, right? So you may have things like silent data errors, which you didn't necessarily predict in the past. They may, they may be due to a variety of factors or some combination of factors. Right. That's true. So uh, one of the aspects of AI machine learning is when we find a way to get to a bug, then we can try to improving the diversity and making sure we give the feedback to the stimulus generation saying, hey, I see this is high value area. I want you to bias the solver to generate this kind of similar stimulus so that I can exercise that areas of logic so that likely you are going to find some of the bugs you don't expect, but around that area faster. What's the overhead of, of using AI here? Because AI, when you think about it, is, is always about run this as fast as you can and as hard as you can to get sort of a brute force result. Right. So there are two types of overhead. One is so-called training. How large your amount of data you need to train the model for it to be ready to predict. The second overhead is while you're running your regular workload, what's the additional overhead on top of what you, you are running on a regular basis? Those, those are the two, two types of overhead. When we think about training, a lot of people think about dog, cat, uh, different uh, angles on, t on the face, what, I, what exactly is it, what type, what breed is it? But here, you're, what you're dealing with is potentially interactions that are not as clearly defined as what you're getting in a, uh, a physical image, right? Right. So what we are looking at is from coverage, what in the form of co-coverage, like which line is being covered, or in the form of so-called functional coverage, you want to see certain uh, transition or certain pattern to happen saying, hey, this is what I expect. Now, on the other hand, you're correct. For simulation or verification, we are now, most of our customers using so-called constraint random. You define your legal space you want to operate on and let the solver to generate all kind of stimulus, different combinations you might even think of. As you go forward, as you start amassing more data and really understanding where the patterns are, do the algorithms get sparser? Can you make them run lighter weight? Can you make the operations lighter weight in terms of how much power they're going to use and how much performance you need in order to, to make this all work? Yes, we do have this. I talk about incremental learning and transfer learning, which reduce the amount of time and effort to train a model. And it's always ready. We, at the same time, we want to make sure the first training cycle is small. People talking about so-called cold star versus warm star. If you have a brand new environment, how quickly you can bring the model up. 
to the point that it stopped predicting. So we are also working on reducing that so-called cold start time. That opens up a whole can of worms though, right? Because now it's who owns that data and who modified it as you go forward. Right, it has been always a concern. That's why uh, we have this two set of model. One is pre-chain, it's shipped with the product. When it hit the ground, it can start predicting. Another is we just have the flow set up, then customer will fit in their own data and, and train the model uh, from day one. And gradually it will come to speed to start predicting. But no matter what, everybody's going to have to become familiar with this in the design cycle over time, right? Yeah, of course. One of the most useful applications in a lot of the verification has been simulation. How does AI work with this? So verification has been used for 30, 40 years. We don't want to create a brand new flow because user has to use AI machine learning. So our approach is trying to assimilate as possible into the existing simulation flow. That's why a lot of current solution is integrated at the simulator level, and you don't need to like learn another language work using a different workflow. It's all tightly integrated into simulation workflow. And to some extent, this is sort of natural, right? Because a lot of this is computational math as well. So basically what you're doing is computation, but you're doing it slightly differently than what you were doing in the past. You've got another tool to be able to leverage. Of course. We don't want to reinvent some new new way, new methodology people have to learn. While we're working, we just complement with what is working. And using machine learning to do something that human beings tend not to be good at, taking a long time, and also reduce some of the redundancy. Overall, it just save human time, save uh, uh, machine cycles. So looking at the scrap that you have here, does it get better over time? Do you close that gap or is it still just getting so complex that keeping it right where it is is, is enough? We have been saying it so-called ship left. We want this graph to ship left so that you can get to 100% faster. We also want to have a so-called move up effect. You can potentially move up more than 100% that you initially defined. What we define as 100% can change over time. As we know, you have market demands, you might have a new feature coming in, you find a new bug, then things are changing. So how can we get to 100% faster and possibly we can move up to over 100% or even reduce sometimes 100%. Reason being we can reduce from 100% lower is we identify some of the so-called coverage objects turn out to be unreachable. Whatever you define as just oversight, you cannot reach them by any means so that you don't need to even spend time trying to cover them. How do you define above 100%? Is it adding resiliency into the design? So 100% varies from project to project. Typically start from functional spec, microarchitecture. You first define what you want to cover. Then gradually, as your knowledge accumulated, you might come up with something. I don't want this to happen. So it's a collection of the knowledge within the project team. It can change over time. So that's very important. Whatever you, you say is 100%, it's not really fixed. So as you, you get to know more unknown, then the known part. So this is defining the known part. But whatever unknown you find, and it gradually tend to know, and then you keep adjusting this 100% line. But you're, what you're really doing here is reducing the time to corner cases, right? You need to understand those corner cases and really understand how to fix them much earlier. That's, that's the most important one, and that's the one a customer will willing to pay for. Something they don't know how to get there, or sometimes they know, but it's so painful. But there's another we call low hanging fruit is, can we reduce the redundancy? So every day you run thousands of regressions. A lot of them just covering the exact same thing. Day over day, test over test. Can machine learning learn the pattern and identify, hey, I have gone to that path hundreds of times. I don't want you to go down that path again. You have proven, then go to a different path. We use the cycle licensing to traverse to a different area. That's another area AI machine learning can help. Well, Chen, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you, Ed.